Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're talking with three marine ecologists, Sally Holbrook, Rush Schmidt, and Andy Brooks from UC Santa Barbara. For the past two decades, they have spent their summers on the island of Morea in French Polynesia at the Gump Research Station studying corals. We talk about their passion for science and why they still love being out in the field doing research. I grew up just loving nature and being outside. I mean, every, I think every good biologist sort of was a person that collected frogs or something, right? And I never grew out of that. But what changed for me is in college, I discovered the power of science as a logic system, right? It actually is a framework that allows you to logically find your way through a series of alternatives that what is the most plausible explanation for some phenomena that occurs out there. And so I was able to combine my curiosity about the real world and my excitement about nature with this a powerful framework that actually leads you down pathways that you have no idea you're gonna to get to. It's the ecological surprises in our case, which are the most exciting things. Oh, that, that's wrong. We were completely wrong. We're, you know, where did the wheels come off, right? And then you start over again saying, okay, well, this assumption had to be wrong for this result to come out. And so it's an exciting sort of process to be involved in. Also, you know, I love being in the field. I mean, you know, when you get more senior, you tend to manage research, but Sally and I and Andy sort of resist only being science managers. We actually <laughs> still want to do it, right? That's why we're happy to design cages and build them and put them out there. So it's the variety of things you do as well. It's not just the thought process, it's also the seeing and the doing that's exciting. And we work in places like this. I mean, what could be better, right? I mean, it's just fabulous. Absolutely. You know? I think I mean, one you spent a week in our office. I love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the thing I like about it is I always tell my students that studying ecology is, is like building a jigsaw puzzle. You're trying to fit together all these little pieces, but you, you don't know what it's going to look like when you're finished, right? There's no box with a picture on it. <laughs> uh, just sort of say, oh, it's going to be a red barn with two horses. You're, you're sort of starting with these observations and, oh, look, this piece seems to fit this piece. And by putting enough pieces together, eventually you start to get an idea of what the larger piece might be. Um, and so I think a lot of people think that science uh, is all about math and, and it's very cold and logical and structured. But there's a tremendous amount of creativity in it. And there's creativity in the way you design your experiments, the way you interpret your experiments, the way you view nature. And uh, I think that's just the exciting thing. And working with people, you get different viewpoints. They see the world in a slightly different way. They say something, and all of a sudden, a little light bulb goes off. It's like, oh, wait, that kind of explains this. You know, and there's another little piece you put in the puzzle. So. Uh, to me, it's just a constant. Every day I wake up, I see something new, I learn something new. Um, it's, it's never the same. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I also really like the fact that often things don't work, <laughs> and therefore you have to think up something different to do, um, and that's really, really challenging, and often the things that don't work provide you with the most insight. One other thing that the three of us, I think, would all say is a really neat thing here is to have students here working with us. We have grad students and undergraduates always with us working in the field here. And it's just really fun to see them coming through, learning all the new things that they learn, and developing into scientists as well. And so, to me, that's a very rewarding yeah. aspect of being able to have prolonged field seasons where we're here for months at a time and we're really able to train students and work with them and see them developing their projects. And, and that's really, really rewarding, yeah. I think, and a lot of fun. You met Sammy and Stella. Yeah. You know. They're wonderful. <laughs> they yeah. are, yeah. We met graduate student Sammy Davis in previous episodes where we learned about the rise of macroalgae on the reefs of Tahiti and what that means for fish and corals. We also met graduate student Stella Swanson and saw her research about a massive die-off of sea urchins and their important role in the ecosystem. Now let's meet University of Florida graduate students 
Leanne Jacobson, and Jana Hubner to learn about their research on Morea. So coral restoration is predominantly in the Keys right now, Coral Restoration Foundation, where they actually have open water nurseries where they grow coral fragments and then transplant those out back on the reef. So I was looking at making that more effective and more efficient. When we look at corals and we try to get like the world involved in things, it's like, yes, you know, this is awesome, but there's a huge price tag that comes along with restoration. So if I can add an economics angle to that and show that what we're doing, yes, it costs a lot, but the benefits that we're doing cost even greater, I think that that would really motivate um, the average person to kind of like care a little bit more about our coral reefs and the state that they're in. The work I've done so far is on coral biology, so how corals grow and how they bud. So I've looked at, uh, or I've done time-lapse photography actually to see how many buds there are on a coral through time. In shallow water, the corals form a hemisphere, and as you go deeper, they tend to form more of a plating morphology. People haven't really been able to record changes in tissue because all metrics that have been used before are destructive, so you end up killing the coral when you measure how much tissue it has. So by doing this time-lapse photography, I can see how much tissue they're producing through time without killing them. Oh, really yeah. Cool. So I'm able to relate how calcification rates vary with tissue production rates. And um, one of the things I plan to do is use that data um, in a geometric model to predict if the rates that I'm observing which would actually generate these different morphologies that we're seeing on the reef. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Why is Sea Grant? Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. We're learning how scientists study how islands behave over time and the importance of certain species, like algae eating fish, after major disturbance on the reef. You know, people in the financial industry look at long runs of economic data, you know, jobs reports and things that go back three or four years in an attempt to predict what the future financial climate might be. And so we're doing the same thing. We're looking at ecological data that's been collected over 10, 20, 30 years in an attempt to predict what the future environmental conditions might be and how organisms within the ecosystems might respond to those changing conditions. What's interesting that we're finding about the coral and the algae here is many of those interactions between them are taking a long time to play out. These aren't experiments that you put out and you have an answer in a month or even six months. Quite a bit of the larger bodied algal species here are slow in terms of their life history. And so it takes them a while to get established and begin to grow. And coral, even fast growing coral also, is slow, right, compared to many other species. So we're looking at interactions that take years rather than months usually to to happen so we have to be patient uh -huh. and, and that time scale actually is very important one of the things that we discovered one of the really great things about working in this in Moray and this island is that it has this history of being disturbed but the coral reef on the forehead recovers within a decade. It's just an amazing resilience. And so it's got high cover of coral, it gets disturbed, lowered dramatically. It's down to, after this last disturbance, two, three, four percent on the coral reef. It's on a trajectory to be back to its 50 percent cover of where it was before the disturbance in a decade, right? And this is the third time it's happened in the last 40 years, right? And so one of the key questions we've been asking is what are the properties that lead to this very high resilience? So you can actually figure out what humans can do to preserve that, those, those factors that lead to the high resilience. And it turns out there's two really important things that, that, you know, if you think about it, aren't that surprising. One is you have to keep the bottom suitable for coral babies to settle, and that right. means you can't have macroalgae. After each of these three disturbances, the bottom offshore, even though there was no coral tissue to speak of, never became dominated by macroalgae. And that's because the grazers went crazy, right? And they went crazy in two ways. <laughs> Most of them were parrotfish, but there's some surgeons that, that were responsible for this as well. The first thing that happened is, as soon as the discovery, the, 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 the bottom was disturbed, 
microalgae begins to grow, which is the food for most of the grazers. And they acted as their food limited. They ate more and more and more. And so the average body size of parrotfish doubled in a year. They got fat. That's the first thing that happened. Within that year, the second thing that happened is there was this big population explosion of parrotfish. So we think island-wide it went up by something like 50%. I mean, just this huge population explosion. The reason that happened is because the babies settle into specific corals that are in the lagoon. Those corals aren't disturbed either by these large disturbances that destroy the coral offshore or by humans. They're much more sensitive to human activities. But those nursery habitats have remained intact, right? And because they're intact, the parrotfish populations were able to respond, right? So the combination of each parrotfish eating more and getting fatter and there are more parrotfish to do it meant the bottom was preserved so that it was suitable for coral to settle. The second major event that happened is we have massive recruitment of new coral babies from somewhere. They're not <laughs> coming from the offshore because there are no adults out there. So now what we're, we're doing, some of our scientists are using these really sophisticated genetic forensic techniques. Rob Tonin from Hawaii is one of them. Um, looking at where the source populations are from the corals. And if we can identify those, those are the ones that you actually have to protect because they're seeding the coral reef. So the important lessons here is if you want to protect the offshore, you don't overfish, everyone knows that. But the second thing you do is you protect those inshore nurseries, right? Which is less sort of apparent. So to do that, you also want to manage the land very carefully because those inner reefs that serve as the nurseries are really sensitive to land use patterns, runoff, sediment, and that sort of thing. And so because of the disturbance happened while you guys were monitoring the area, you have the data that right. exactly. actually supports yeah. all yeah. those ideas. That's right. And yes. we also not only have the time sure. series, which is really critical for doing this, we actually could supplement it by these kinds of experiments. And so we were able to go out in the middle of these things and actually cage the bottom and ask questions like, if it wasn't for the parrotfish, would you get macroalgae? And the answer is yes. The bottom on the fore reef would have turned into macroalgae if it hadn't been for the grazing. So it's these combinations of being able to do process studies with experiments coupled with time series that you actually can nail down what the what's going on. Can you explain to me what a time series is? Time series is just repeated measurements of the same things over time. It's it, you know, it, some people call it monitoring, but monitoring sounds like there's no hypothesis dri driving it. Time series is actually a hypothesis-driven collection of data over time, or monitoring data. And so by calling it monitoring, you're sort of missing the point of why you're doing it. You're doing it not just to see what's happening. Gee, how is, it's really to ask questions about what is it that creates the amazing resilience the floor reef has in this case. That's one of the things. So we have these ideas about what it is that's creating the floor reef. And so, as Russ said, the difference between time series and monitoring is really, the time series is collecting data now, but in an attempt to project into the future. Whereas monitoring is really just recording what's happening. Uh -huh. you know? and so, monitoring gives you a really great record of what last year and the year before looked like, but doesn't really tell you much about what next year and the year after might be. As time series does. Yeah, and, uh, one interesting thing that we found our LTR project has six sites around the island, two on each side, where we gather time series data. And the data gathered are biological data, how many fish are there, the corals, things like that, plus a lot of physical data, the temperature, currents, waves. And those data are gathered not only in the lagoons, but also on the fore reef. So we basically have a transect from the fringing reef right by shore off to the fore reef at these six locations. And it's been really interesting because over the last decade or so, those six sites have had some similarities in their behavior and things that happen to them, but also differences because the different sides of the island have different physical regimes and disturbances have hit different areas more or less strongly. So it's been very, very interesting for us to look at how the whole island is behaving over time and in response to different kinds of disturbance. So it's our time series is, is a very powerful one because it's replicated at these different sites and that gives rise to lots of comparisons that we can make and insights that we can get. It's also becoming long enough now, we have enough years of data, that it's becoming valuable to people doing other studies. Uh -huh. And so, for instance, our data were just used in a study that was published in the journal Science by a group of researchers in Scotland 
who were actually looking at changes in biodiversity on a global scale. And so they needed time series of data from many locations around the world in order to make these sort of larger meta-analysis, an analysis based on other analyses. And so our, our time series data was used as part of that, that larger effort. As this program goes on and continues to collect these data, they become more and more valuable, not only to what we're trying to do, but to what other scientists are trying to do in other places. And I think one of the other things that's important um, is that the data that we're collecting, the time series we're doing, are available to the public. They're publicly accessible. So any scientist who wants them can access them on our website. Any high school science class that wants them, they can access yeah. it. Um, so any so member of the public. public. If they wanted them, yeah. they can access the, the data. And so the idea, of course, is, is that we're, we're, we're collecting data that's not just useful for the small 20 PhD scientists who are actually working on this project, but also to the larger scientific community as well. And so they are used by people looking for these kinds of data worldwide. They are used actually for, for educational purposes as well. And so we're hopeful that we get teachers involved who learn how to manipulate our data so they can get their students involved and excited about what data actually can give you insights into and so forth. And so we're hoping to reach a much broader audience, not just coral reef scientists, but beyond. Coral reef scientists as well. <laughs> And I think that's a philosophy that the long-term ecological research community has, that the data are publicly accessible. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to know, compare a grassland to a coral reef, the data are available to do that. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a member of a club to, to have access to it. So it's pretty exciting. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Welcome back. We're on the island of Morea in French Polynesia, learning about the intersection of science and traditional knowledge in managing our coral reef island ecosystems, from the mountains to lagoons to the outer reef. It's really interesting that one of the things that we do do is talk to the elders about how our scientific information matches what do they understand, how they understand the, the universe works. They're quite good at actually pointing out areas where you have higher concentrations of these kinds of fishes and this and whatever. They may not know the reason why they're higher there, but they know they're higher there. And they have ideas about why you, you get this variation, some of which are correct, some of which yeah. you know we don't know yet. Um, really, one of the really surprising things to us is that when we talk to the elders about um, our scientific findings, for example, the species of grazers that are important in keeping the algae suppressed and stuff, they actually know that. They actually understand that. And historically, there was this really interesting um, um, cultural um, setting where when there was a disturbance in the lagoon, or you know, these disturbances out to coral reefs have been happening forever, when there was disturbances, the chief would declare the lagoon a sacred time and there would be no fishing. You have to go get pelagic fish, which is exactly the right thing to do because then the parrotfish populations and the other kinds of grazing populations can respond to and keep the algae down, right? And then after several years, then it was no longer sacred. You can go back into the lagoon and fish again. Now we've established marine protected areas, which are spatial, not temporal closures. They're spatial closures. And the idea is you don't go into those marine protected areas to fish, but you can fish outside them now. And so what the fishers now do is they target these very grazers that are responsible for keeping the bottom free of the algae, right? Which is the wrong thing to be doing, right? And so in some ways, they had it correct that you want temporal closures. You don't want to overfish, and when there is a disturbance, you want to leave it alone. Mm -hmm then open it up again. And, and that so, kind of management is a much more active That's right. Yeah. That's, process. Right. That's, that's right. right. That's right. And so we have a lot to learn from historic ideas as well. And so, you know, our ideas of marine protected areas ought, also ought to include things like temporal closures as well. So we do, um, in, in, in a way, try to ground truth some of their local knowledge. Because, of course, I mean, we all remember when we were small that it rained five times as hard. Or <laughs> you think about your, your classroom and how tall the desks are, and then you go back later and it's the desks are 
you know, sort of Alice in Wonderland. I, I can't believe I ever sat at something so small. Um, so as we get older, our perception sure. of what things look like change. The fish that I didn't catch was yeah, way bigger. It was huge, and there were many more of them. And so one of the things that the LTR is really set up to do by collecting data over long time periods is to provide the data, to take away that subjective, oh, I remember when the fish were bigger or the coral was more plentiful, and, and actually have the data that, that will tell you, well, no, actually it was pretty much the same. It's just your perception, your perspective has changed. Um, and so by taking these long time series of data and then matching them up, to some of the patterns that the elders have described. Um, we've, we've been finding lots of interesting matches like the one that Russ just mentioned. So in lots of cases, their um, traditional knowledge is you supported it with science. Sure. That's right. Yeah. So, so one of the interesting things that science can, can do is that we actually potentially can make forward predictions, which is not possible unless you understand the mechanism that produces the change. And that's where talking with elders and they have an understanding of why things are but not what causes it right okay. and then if we can understand what causes those patterns then we can predict okay with these kinds of changes to the environment these are likely to be the consequences of that and so science I think can really benefit by learning from the elders and then understanding mechanisms are those patterns real and if they are real what are the mechanisms producing them and then move forward from there you know, I think what we're discovering is that some of the elders are coming forward now and saying, well, in the old days, when this happened, we would expect then this to happen. You know, uh -huh. this would have followed that. We don't really know why, but, but just we've observed that time and time again, that when the uh, crown of thorns comes into the lagoon and eat the coral, then we see more parrotfish in the lagoons. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're getting instances where the elders are coming and saying, you know, it, it's not working, something's broken. You know, the way we understand the system to work, we're not seeing the same types of patterns that we would expect to see. And of course, that's because there have been other disturbances now that we've introduced that have disrupted the mechanisms behind the patterns that they were observing. And if we understand those mechanisms, we're able to say, well, this might have happened before, but we've now changed this mechanism. We've removed something from the system or we've added something to the system. And now we actually predict that it's going to go in an entirely different direction because the, it's not, the system's not the way it was 200 years ago. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years. Through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world of difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA.